on World News Tonight. More offences. Russia keeps on their offence on the east of Ukraine, which comes with a barrage of missile attacks, killing civilians in Lviv. Back to business. Firms were drastically hit by the extreme lockdown in China, but major industries were allowed to resume operations in Shanghai, but still faces challenges. Easing restrictions. CDC's travel mask mandate struck down by a federal judge in the United States tonight. Find out how the White House responds. And it's the Sesame Street. Elmo, Big Bird and Cookie Monster welcomes children in San Diego as a new theme park opens their doors. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off tonight's coverage with the ongoing war in Ukraine. Ukraine said a Russian missile attack killed seven people in Lviv, the first civilian victims in the western city, and reported signs that Russia had started its anticipated new offensive in the east. A Russian missile attack killed seven people in Lviv on Monday, according to Ukrainian officials, the first civilian victims in the western city. Local officials said there were four strikes, three on warehouses not in use by the military, and another on a car service station. Lviv's mayor said the attacks damaged civilian infrastructure, houses, and a school. What we see in Ukraine today is a genocide that the aggressor is carrying out on purpose, killing civilians. Seven civilians had plans for life. Today, their lives have ended. Pushed back by resistance in the north, Moscow has refocused its attacks in the two eastern provinces known as the Donbass, while launching long-distance strikes at other targets, including the capital, Kiev. Russia's defense ministry said it had hit hundreds of military targets in Ukraine overnight. Russia denies targeting civilians. In Mariupol, explosions rumbled and smoke rose on Monday from the Azovstal steelworks as Russia tried to take full control of the besieged port city. The Mariupol City Council said at least 1,000 civilians, mainly women, children and elderly citizens, were hiding in underground shelters beneath the vast steel plant, adding that Russia was dropping heavy bombs onto the Ukrainian-held factory. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin on Monday railed against sanctions imposed by the West designed to punish Moscow for invading Ukraine. He claimed Russia's economy withstood the pressure and is stabilizing. Now we can confidently declare that such policy with respect to Russia has failed. The strategy of economic blitzkrieg proved unsuccessful. The UN said that more than 2,000 civilians had been killed in Ukraine since Russia invaded on February 24th. The United States is set to begin training the Ukrainian military on the use of the Howitzer cannons, including and its latest weapons package for Kyiv. This comes as Russian forces move towards a new offensive targeting the eastern part of Ukraine. Washington plans to provide training for Ukraine's military on the operation of howitzer artillery systems in the coming days. A senior U.S. defense official who spoke on condition of anonymity explained that the training would take place outside Ukraine. The official highlighted that the move comes as the Biden administration seeks to strengthen Ukraine's military against Russia's aggression in the eastern part of the country. The 155-millimeter howitzer cannons are part of the America's additional weapons package to Ukraine worth 800 million U.S. dollars. The package, which President Joe Biden announced last week, includes many of the highly effective weapons systems. The official further explained that there were roughly 76 Russian battalion tactical groups in southern and eastern Ukraine, which is an increase of about 11 in the past days. The official added that fighting still continues in the port city of Mariupol, which Russia is trying to take full control of. Meanwhile, Russian forces stepped up their attacks targeting the eastern Donbas region on Monday. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky stressed that his country will not give away anything that is Ukrainian. Also on Monday, explosions rocked Lviv in a rare and deadly attack on the city located in the east of Ukraine. The city has been serving as a safe hub for refugees, Western officials and the media. 
Ukrainian authorities say that at least seven people were killed in the latest Russian missile strikes. Dozens of people have been arrested in India in connection with the violence against police after a comment insulting Muslims went viral on social media. Clashes have broken out between the majority Hindu and minority Muslim communities during religious processions in several parts of India in recent weeks. Indian police arrested 14 people in connection with the violent clashes between Hindus and Muslims during a Hindu religious procession in New Delhi. This is the aftermath of a Hindu religious procession that passed through a Muslim-majority neighborhood in New Delhi. Several participants had held up swords. As they approached the local mosque, trouble broke out. Both sides blame each other for starting the fight. They started shouting things like, if you want to stay in India, you'll have to chant to a Hindu god or else go to Pakistan. Remove the mic from the mosque, close the meat shops. There were some boys who couldn't tolerate this, then God knows what happened. Why do they have swords? Why do they need to do that? Authorities have since arrested dozens of people, but this is far from an isolated case. The same weekend, a mob attacked a police station in Hubli, injuring 12 officials, blaming them for not doing enough after a provocative anti-Muslim message went viral. In recent weeks, there's been a spate of religious violence, 13 leading opposition figures signed a joint statement expressing their shock at the silence of far-right Prime Minister Narendra Modi. This silence is an eloquent testimony to the fact that such private armed mobs enjoy the luxury of official patronage. We are deeply concerned, as reports indicate that there is a sinister pattern. Incendiary hate speeches preceded the aggressive armed religious processions unleashing communal violence. The ruling Hindu Nationalist Party denies that there's been a rise in intercommunal tensions. Critics such as Human Rights Watch, though, say hate has been normalised under a leadership that promotes Hindu supremacy. New Zealand and Singapore will be working more closely on the green economy and the fight against climate change, Prime Minister Lee Singh long announced. Speaking at a joint press conference with New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern at the Istana, PM Lee said both countries share similar perspectives on climate change, which is the existential change of these times. PM Arden, who arrived in Singapore for the three-day visit, thanked PM Lee for the contact that the two leaders maintained throughout the pandemic, such as a phone call during the height of the lockdowns in 2020, when they discussed ways for the two countries to support each other's food security and resolve supply chain issues. PM Lee said that this new area of collaboration will see the two countries work on initiatives in energy transition technology, carbon markets, sustainable transport and waste management for a start. It also reflects both countries' shared commitment to implement the Paris Agreement, a pact among countries to reduce their carbon footprint and to work together to seize growth opportunities in the green economy. Climate change and the green economy will be the new fifth pillar in the Singapore-New Zealand Enhanced Partnership, which the two countries inked during PM Arden's first visit here as Premier in 2019. The other four pillars are trade and economics, security and defence, science, technology and innovation, and people-to-people -people links. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight and we move on to the updates of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Chinese government says it will allow companies in key sectors to resume production in Shanghai in a bid to lighten the blow on the citywide lockdown it's forecast to have on global supply chains. But President Xi Jinping's zero COVID measures remain an immense challenge to other countries. And there are concerns Beijing's policy will have a long-lasting negative impact on South Korea's export-driven economy. Shanghai is on track to resume production after the Chinese government announced plans to help key industries get back to business in its commercial hub. Around 600 companies in the semiconductor, automobile and medical sectors will resume operations. But some say starting production lines in Shanghai will not be easy as it still remains difficult to bring workers to factories due to lockdowns. An added problem is that China's strict zero-COVID measures have also expanded to other regions, including the Jiangsu province. Not to mention, China's lockdowns have already hit the auto industry and it's not the only sector to be affected. South Korea is heavily dependent on Chinese imports, particularly in batteries and chips. 
So if productions in production lines were to continue, there would be a ripple effect on South Korea's economy as inventories of raw materials are running low. The Biden administration will no longer enforce a U.S. mask mandate on public transportation after a federal judge in Florida ruled that the directive was unlawful, overturning a key White House effort to reduce the spread of COVID-19. The Biden administration's latest effort to reduce the spread of COVID-19 was struck down in a Florida court on Monday when a federal judge ruled that a mask mandate on public transportation was unlawful. U.S. health officials just last week extended the mandate by 15 days, requiring travelers to wear masks on airplanes, trains, and in taxis and transit hubs, saying they needed time to assess the impact of a recent rise in COVID-19 cases. The latest ruling, made by a district judge appointed by former President Donald Trump, came in a lawsuit filed in Tampa last year by a group called the Health Freedom Defense Fund. The judge argued that the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had exceeded its authority with the mandate, had not sought public comment, and did not adequately explain its decisions. The judge sent the issue back to the CDC. But in the meantime, a U.S. administration official said the Biden administration will not enforce the U.S. transportation mask mandate. So this is obviously a disappointing decision. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki called the judge's decision disappointing adding that the Biden administration would continue to recommend that people wear masks. The ruling could create confusion on airplanes where the mask mandate has caused a surge in incidents and altercations between airline officials enforcing the mandate and passengers rejecting the demand they cover their faces. The Federal Aviation Administration said that since January 2021, there have been a record 7,060 unruly passenger incidents reported, and 70 percent involved masking. The ruling comes as the CDC on Monday dropped its do not travel COVID-19 recommendations for about 90 international destinations. A top Democrat in the House of Representatives said that in an interview that saving democracy was critical to fighting climate change, claiming alternative rights groups are distracting from the necessary work from saving the planet. January 6, 2021, President Donald Trump attempted a coup, says Democratic Representative Jamie Raskin, and that will be the centerpiece of committee hearings in Congress next month. In an interview with Reuters, NPR, and The Guardian newspaper, Raskin, a committee member who led the prosecution of Trump's second impeachment, said the hearings will lay out for the public the steps the former president and his associates took to try to stay in power, despite a clear-cut defeat. It's what the political scientists call a self-coup because it's not the military or some other faction attacking the president. It's the president, fearful of defeat, overthrowing the constitutional process. It was unclear whether Raskin was expressing only his thoughts or the thinking of fellow lawmakers serving on the special committee investigating the January 6th attack. On that day in 2021, Trump supporters stormed the Capitol building, encouraged by the Republican president, in a speech outside the White House to protest the certification of Democrat Joe Biden's victory. And we're going to have to fight much harder. And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. Trump was prepared to seize the presidency and uh, likely to invoke the Insurrection Act and declare martial law. So we're going to tell the whole story of everything that happened. There was a violent insurrection, an attempted coup, and we were saved by Mike Pence's refusal to go along with that plan and the valor and the bravery of our officers who stood strong against the attempt to just overrun the whole process. The violence capped months of Trump arguing the election had been stolen from him through voter fraud, a claim he still asserts despite its rejection by numerous court rulings, Trump's own Justice Department, and recounts sanctioned by his fellow Republicans. Several days of unrest in Sweden, sparked by a far-right group's plans to burn copies of the Quran, have injured several dozen people, according to the police, calling for more risk resources to deal with the violence. Throwing rocks and burning debris. Protesters clashed with police in Nor shopping in eastern Sweden. The flashpoint plans by a far right anti immigrant group to burn copies of the Quran. Police say several people were injured after warning shots were fired, none seriously. Sunday's violence followed days of unrest in several Swedish cities, 
over the actions of Danish far-right politician Rasmus Paladin. He leads Stram Kors, or the Hardline Movement, and is known for burning copies of the Quran, Islam's most sacred text. On Friday, in an immigrant neighborhood in Stockholm, Paladin set a copy of the Holy Book on fire during a rally. He intends to run in Sweden's legislative elections in September if he gathers enough signatures and says he's currently on a tour of the country. Apart from Stockholm, violent clashes have been reported in at least five other cities, including Malmo, where protesters burned several vehicles. Over the past several days, more than a dozen people have been arrested during the unrest. It's not the first time protests against the actions of the hardline movement in Paladin have turned violent. In 2020, demonstrators damaged storefronts in Malmo and set cars alight. Paladin, who has been convicted of racist insults, has also tried to plan similar Quran burnings in other European countries, including France and Belgium. After the social media company Twitter adopted a so-called poison pill to protect itself from the second biggest shareholder's $43 billion cash buyout offer, Elon Musk taunted Twitter. Elon Musk took a swipe at the board of Twitter on Monday after the social media company adopted a poison pill to protect itself from Musk's $43 billion cash buyout offer. Responding to a user's post criticizing the Twitter board, Musk tweeted that the, quote, board salary will be $0 if my bid succeeds, so that's around $3 million per year saved right there. The Tesla and SpaceX CEO, who has been critical of Twitter's policies, did not elaborate on the tweet. Twitter did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Musk, who calls himself a free speech absolutist, is Twitter's second largest shareholder. On Thursday, he made an all-cash offer to buy the social media company for $54.20 a share. Following Twitter's adoption of the poison pill, Musk on Saturday tweeted, Love Me Tender, an Elvis Presley song. A poison pill is a strategy designed to thwart hostile takeovers whereby other shareholders get new shares in the company, often at a discount, diluting the suitor's stake. Meanwhile, in a series of tweet replies, Twitter co-founder and former CEO Jack Dorsey on Saturday called out the company's board, saying, quote, It's consistently been the dysfunction of the company. Dorsey's statement was a reply to a tweet by venture capitalist Gary Tan that said, The wrong partner on your board can literally make a billion dollars in value evaporate. Shares of Twitter have risen roughly 15 percent since Musk disclosed his more than 9 percent stake on April 4th. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Cristiano Ronaldo and his partner Georgina Rodriguez, who announced in October last year that they were expecting twins, say that one of the two babies have died. Asking for privacy during his difficult time, the couple thanked the doctors and nurses for their expert care and support. Japanese finance minister said that the government is carefully watching the foreign exchange market trends as the Japanese yen tumbled a 20-year low against the dollar. The yen has also lost about 10% against the dollar so far this year. Dressed in traditional clothes and playing folkloric tunes, a group of black Iraqs paraded through the streets of Basra's Zubair district, surrounding by children clapping and singing along the occasion of the Ganga Green Festival. Protesters gathered in Toronto to demand justice for Canada's indigenous children that suffered abuse in residential schools, many of them run by the Catholic Church. Philippine rescuers continue the search for over 100 people still missing in landslides set off by Typhoon Meggy over a week ago while intermittent rain has hampered the efforts of the rescue teams. The threat of another landslide is also imminent as the ground is unstable. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with the opening of a new theme park based on the long-running U.S. children's TV show, Sesame Street, in San Diego, California. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night.